Hey guys, in this video I wanted to share some research that I've come across on this rather rare rifle that I acquired recently, um, as well as talking about some unique surprises that I came across with this particular example. This is a 1933 dated FB Radom KBK SWZ31, which is shortened for Karabinek Sportovev Zur Chijeshi Yaden, or in English, Sporting Rifle Model 1931. It is a 22 rimfire trainer, stylized like the domestically produced WZ-29 short rifle of the time period in use with the Polish military. It is my understanding that these 22 trainers are exceedingly rare to find in the U.S., as I have personally only seen a couple of these come up for sale in my comparatively short collecting hobby experience. Now, the key problem with doing research on these trainers is the limited reference material available. These trainers are only very briefly mentioned in a few books, uh, mostly in Polish language, but a couple in English language, and uh, some internet articles. So uh, what I can present here is just kind of a summary of those small morsels of information pieced together. So starting with some historical background, after Poland gained its independence after World War I, there was immediately a need to develop its military and train its new recruits accordingly. At first, there were no specific training rifles on hand, and trainees uh, primarily used shotguns for firearms training at short distances before they moved on to the standard uh, issue military rifles. There was a growing need to have a dedicated training rifle in a low caliber uh, for trainees to get used to them, uh, primarily to get used to shooting and fundamentals before moving on to full-size military rifles and those more potent cartridges. The Polish military and the domestic arms developers started to do research into what other countries were doing at that time for training rifles. The first iteration of military trainers were not purpose-built military training rifles like the KKW trainers in Nazi Germany, but modified or rechambered battle rifles. These were the Karabinek Zur 1898, or commonly known here in the U.S. as Polish K-98 carbines, that were converted to have 22 barrels had their Mauser 98 bolts extensively modified to work with uh, 22 rimfire, and had their magazines deactivated to single shot only. From an outward appearance with the bolt closed, these are virtually identical to a regular Polish K-98, but had a large 22 added to the handguard to prevent misfeeding the wrong ammunition in the rifle. I've only come across one resource for this, but these appear to have been officially designated as the KBK SWZ-29. And obviously I don't have one of those, those are pretty rare as well, but I'm just showing you the example of a uh, Polish K-98 in my collection just for visual reference. There was also an intermediate trainer out there, the KBK SWZ-30, and that I only have seen diagrams for, uh, which I'll show here on screen. But it is my understanding that these were primarily for civilian sporting purposes. And I think a couple were used for military training purposes as well. These were originally offered in both 22 short and 22 long rifle. But after 1934, these were only made in 22 long rifle due to the lack of demand for 22 short firearms. And this will kind of come into play later on in this video. The second iteration of a military training rifle was this one, the KBK SWZ-31. It was designed from the ground up as a purpose-built 22 trainer and not adapted or converted from an existing rifle. It was designed to mimic the look and feel of the WZ-29 short rifle, which was the standard military uh, issue rifle at the time in the Polish military. Uh, the barrels were produced by the PWU, or Państwowa Wytwórna Uzbrojenia, uh, and that is a arms industry conglomerate in Poland, but all final assembly took place in FB Radom. So these trainers were produced by FB Radom exclusively from 1932 to 1939, 
but I have no idea uh, what the production figures are as this documentation was probably lost during World War II. Though I did come across a couple of uh, uh, documentation figures that described some listings of uh, how many were in inventory at uh, various Polish training schools at different time periods in the 1930s, but uh, nothing more definite than that. It is believed that after the invasion of Nazi Germany in 1939, these may have been used by the Germans as well, as a good number of these uh, were GI bringbacks onto the U.S., kind of like this one, which is duffel cut. Uh, since these were of very limited military effectiveness, I would assume that these were repurposed as additional trainers uh, for the German army and uh, any of these that kind of came into uh, the U.S. via GI bringbacks may have been simply pulled from surrender piles at the end of the war in Germany. Now what I'd like to do is take a closer look at this trainer and compare it to an actual WZ-29 short rifle. In this case, I have a 1931 dated K-29. Compared to the WZ-29, the trainer does appear to mimic one from far away. All in all, the Poles did a pretty good job of designing this trainer to replicate the WZ-29. I compared the trainer to this full-size uh, WZ-29 and the overall length for both is around 43 inches from muzzle to butt plate. And the overall uh, weight of the two is right around nine pounds unloaded with uh, no ammunition. The differences come to light as you look closer. So as you can see, the bolt of the trainer is not of a Mauser 98 design, but rather a similar design to that of the post-war WZ-48 Mosin Nagant 22 trainer. And as we have the bolt out, you can see that the face is modified for 22 rimfire. Internally to the bolt, you'll see that it has a spring-loaded plunger that fits inside of the bolt body that impacts the firing pin over here, which sets off the uh, primer or priming compound of the 22 rimfire cartridge. And I uh, don't want to take the bolt apart further than this because uh, I'm not exactly sure how to put it back together after that. Now, obviously, the Mauser 98 bolt has this big, long uh, extractor, and it's got the ejector over here at the bolt release. Whereas on the trainer, it's a little bit different. Um, and you'll see over here, there is this sliding uh, assembly, or I'm sorry, a sliding component with kind of a, a U uh, tab over here with a, a notch for the rimfire cartridge. And what that does is, as the bolt is pulled back, it will act as a extractor for the rimfire cartridge, like this one. There it goes. And as the bolt is pulled back sharply, it lifts up and flicks the spent casing out and therefore acts also as an ejector. It is single shot only, as you can see, because it doesn't have a trigger guard with a floor plate or any sort of magazine. The rear sight ladder of the WZ-31 trainer is simplified with only one set of numbers on the left hand side ranging from 2 to 10 corresponding to a distance of 20 to 100 meters to account for the limited range of 22 rim fire. The trigger is a two-stage Mauser trigger with a very simple tension bar mechanism for the spring instead of a spring-loaded complex uh, uh, sear mechanism of the Mauser 98 design like this. The receiver seems to be manufactured from a cylinder tube rather than the complex and fine machining of the Mauser 98 receiver. Also, it looks like it's a split bridge receiver type design since the bolt handle is going to be uh, located further up on the receiver and we'll need to pass through the receiver down here. The handguard retaining lip 
of the KBK SWZ31 wraps around the entire receiver or the circumference of the receiver rather than just half of it like the WZ29. And as you have seen before, there is a slot cut out here in the receiver to allow the safety flag to pass its way through in the firing position. And just another shot of the underside, um, you'll see that the KBK SWZ31 does not have the sort of extended trigger guard with the, the floor, plate, floor plate assembly over here since it's single shot only. Now as far as finish goes on these training rifles, these were not actually blued like other military Mausers, but these were zinc parkerized and then had black enamel paint applied on top. Unfortunately, on this example, a lot of the exposed metal um, had all of the paint kind of rubbed off, but I will put up some pictures over here, um, kind of taking it uh, out of the wood. You'll see that right around the wood line area, you'll still see the specks of paint peeking through, and the uh, original enamel paint is still preserved uh, beneath the wood line. Now, one thing I do want to point out is uh, the marking over here on the receiver side rail. So this is marked KBK SWZ31 uh, for this 1933 dated example. I have seen at least two examples of uh, early 1932 ones that are simply designated M31 as well. So if you do see that, uh, that doesn't mean that it's, you know, faked or re-stamped or anything like that. I think that was just kind of like the initial designation of this rifle, kind of like for the WZ-29, it started off as the K-29 and then became the WZ-29 later. So operation of these trainers is quite simple. Just, you know, with normal bolt actions, you first, you know, determine that there's nothing in the chambers ready to fire. Uh, you will take a snap cap, for example, in this case. So just showing that this is not a real uh, rimfire cartridge. You place it over here in this little tray combination extractor ejector, and then uh, you pull the bolt home like that, and uh, it locks over here on the uh, handle uh, contact with the receiver as a sort of locking lug. Pull the trigger to fire, and then unlock the bolt, pull it back, Notice it's still in the chamber. You kind of have to give it a little forceful nudge and it'll extract the casing out. And then when you do a little bit of a flick of the bolt handle back, it ejects it up. It's a little bit awkward to do in slow motion. So I'll just try to simulate a, a more natural operation. And it just shot up into space. The safety flag is similar to that of, uh, you know, Mauser 98s or uh, Gewehr 88s, where uh, over here is the firing position when the bolt handle is cocked. You can flip it up and it doesn't fire. Actually, in this position, it really doesn't do anything. So yeah, just knock it back and it's ready to go. And then if you want to decock it, you just hold the trigger down, push it down like that to pull the bolt out. You just kind of like a, a Mosin Nagants, you hold the trigger down, pull the tr or pull the bolt back, and it'll slide right out. Now, getting back to this particular rifle, uh, this was made affordable to me for a couple of reasons, which we'll get into here. So you'll notice over here, the stock is duffel cut. So this entire section can slide out, uh, which means that, yeah, this is probably a GI bring back, but you know, it, I am a little bit disappointed that the cut wasn't made uh, in an obscured line, like over here hidden by the rear barrel band, but I'm fortunate enough that this cut was made relatively cleanly and I, not quite sure if I want to repair it or not, because um, it is part of the rifle's history. Uh, and I mean, like 22 rim fire isn't really going to challenge, uh, you know, blowing this thing out every time I fire it. So 
Um, I'm debating whether or not I want to repair it or just leave it as is. When I first got it, this uh, screw over here in the uh, bolt cocking piece was missing. And obviously, as you can see here, I have a replacement. The original front barrel band spring over here, this was snapped in half and just uh, held in place with wood glue. So I sourced a uh, replacement one. Uh, this one comes from a, a VZ24 uh, stock set that I was able to pop in and it was able to clip into place with no modifications needed. And lastly, uh, as you can tell, the stock is sanded. A lot of the sharp features that would be on like a pristine example are rounded. And uh, a lot of these edges that would have been really nicely squared off are also rounded as well. As you can see over here, it kind of does a little hump instead of having a nice clean cut line. Um, there's also you know, if I shine the light just right, you might be able to see the faint outline of a Polish proof mark here, but this would have been, you know, a, a nice uh, D in a hexagon with a Polish eagle on it. There would have been um, another proof or two proofs over here on the left side of the butt stock and a serial number over here on uh, uh, the bottom of the butt stock. And I believe there would have been uh, another proof mark over here in the uh, sling cutout. As far as serial number goes, the uh, obviously the receiver is uh, 10161. The bolt is numbered 161. The rear sight assembly, or I'm sorry, the ladder is numbered 161. And you'll see it'll be on the underside, but the bolt uh, ejector extractor assembly, it's also uh, serialized 161. There is a shot of the uh, butt plate, 10161, which matches. And the following components are not serialized, but do have Polish Lucky Charm proof marks or inspector markings. That would be the uh, trigger assembly hidden by the wood line. The bayonet lug, uh, or nose cap, whatever you want to call this, I call it the bayonet lug assembly. Uh, the rear sling swivel over here. Uh, the sling bar has one over there. The rear uh, sight spring has the uh, DNA hexagon acceptance proof mark. And the front sight as well. Additionally, the barrel uh, itself is not serialized, but it does have Lucky Charm proof marks on the bottom. And mine has a, it's either a 17 or a 47, depending on how you look at it, uh, stamped on it. Now getting into the, addressing the issues with my examples. So the first one that I wanted to address was when I got it was this, uh, this screw was missing. And I took a look at some examples of uh, completed rifles and it looks like there is a, um, a obviously a, a circular screw with, it looks like a, uh, pig nose or snake eye on um, security uh, type looking screw head and since it was that kind of awkward looking head you know d difficult to find the right uh, screwdriver bit for uh, to work I thought it was to prevent a board recruit from you know messing up the bolt and uh, 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 causing the rifle to become inoperable but that wasn't the case and what I noticed was I watched a video from uh, Battlefield Curator, which uh, featured uh, an example of uh, shooting the rifle, um, this WZ-31 type of training rifle. And that was also missing this screw. And what I would notice is the following. When the bolt was cycled a lot, and I'll kind of simulate it here, I had to force it, 
Um, at one point in the video, uh, the guy that owned it cycled the bolt and it was stuck. The safety flag was kind of stuck in this position. So it was kind of rotated out of position and he had to flick it down to get it back in the firing position. Otherwise, uh, pulling the trigger wouldn't do anything. So then I also noticed that over here in the rifle or in the receiver, there are these grooves over here. It's going to be kind of hard to get it on video, but um, there they are. So it seemed like with the exposed head of the screw, it should act as a guide to prevent this from flopping around and be maintained in the right uh, position for s translating back and forth in this without spinning out of position. So what I did is I took this bolt with me to Ace Hardware into their hardware section where they just have all the screws and uh, nuts and bolts and all that and just uh, you know took a look at their collection of stainless steel screws and saw that they had these uh, pig nose security screws um, obviously they were, you know, of, of a greater length like this. And I basically just found one that had the right, um, uh, thread pitch, uh, thread counts and all that to, um, fit into the threads here. And I wasn't able to find one with, you know, a perfect match for the, uh, inner diameter of this hole. So I got one that was uh, slightly bigger. And what I did is I just basically put the, the, full length of the screw on a uh, drill press, spun it around, and then just slightly shaved off uh, a little bit of the um, outside edge of this screw until I was able to slide it into this little uh, uh, cutout in the receiver without getting hung up. And additionally, the head would be just the right size to fit into this uh, recess and the uh, bolt cocking piece. And then since uh, there really isn't a lot of thread depth in here, you really only need like three or four, uh, I guess, threads of this uh, security screw before it's cut off. So I just cut it off and then ground it so it's uh, somewhat uh, presentable and clean looking. Give it a little bit of a uh, polish with uh, uh, some sandpaper and we're good to go. And with that, I was able to come up with a somewhat unobtainium screw for a very uh, rare and hard to find rifle. The second surprise that came about when I was uh, about to buy ammo for this rifle was what it was chambered in. So it was sold to me as being chambered in 22 long rifle and hopefully I can get this in camera. I got some 22 long rifle dummy rounds. So I just, you know, went to go make sure that everything was functioning appropriately. I went to go put one in and lo and behold, it only went in about 70% of the way. So that's, that's a problem. So at first I thought that, you know, there might be a, a dirty chamber. There might be a, a broken case somewhere in there. So I cleaned it out, I got a cheap boroscope, saw that there was, you know, nothing in there. And so, you know, I, I was kind of freaking out, didn't know, you know, what happened, was this thing rechambered or what? So fortunately, another collector sent over a little piece of Cerosafe alloy. Um, really, I only needed a small sliver of this stuff and I did a chamber cast. So really, I just kind of shaved off a little bit of material here, put it in a, a of a, a, a spoon that I heated up, uh, poured it into the chamber. Um, I did a cast, knocked it out, and it came out like this. Measured um, the barrel, uh, determined that yeah, it's 0.222 inches, so 22 caliber. And I measured the distance from here to here, and saw that it was, you know, the textbook case length of 0.421 which is the same as 22 short which I have a snap cap of here and as you can see it is a lot shorter than 22 long rifle now with that knowledge in mind if we put the 22 short in you'll see that it chambers in there perfectly 
and the bolt closes perfectly on that as well. This all goes back to that article I came across earlier in which I discussed that um, mostly commercial uh, model predecessor uh, KBK SWZ30 which were produced in both 22 long rifle and 22 short. So it appears that there were um, some of these firearms that may have been produced in 22 short and some in 22 long rifle. So um, I did reach out to another collector that had one of these and he confirmed that his is chambered in 22 short as well. So it appears that this wasn't a one-off thing and uh, Definitely, if you have one of these, double check and do a chamber cast uh, before you put any ammunition through them, just to confirm what uh, your chamber size is for. With these mysteries solved, I'm still extremely happy to have this rifle in my collection and hope to have my son uh, fire it as his first uh, rifle um, to get into this uh, hobby as well. Thanks everyone for watching.